Ivy. Yes. Okay, Ivy, we're recording for you. <laughs> How long are we going for tonight, Dr. Beck? Well, what time do you have to go? It's not per se, it's because I'm an hour ahead. So where I'm at right now, so. Where yeah. are you? Ohio. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank it's you. okay. I don't, I don't have a problem. Okay. I have some time to spare. All right. Well, it might take a, a little over an hour. We'll yeah, definitely have okay. you out of here by 10 o'clock your time. Yeah, right. that's. Okay. okay, so Alicia and I talked about Descartes and this is what you want to keep in mind is that most of what you study is after Descartes, after Kant, after Mill, after. So what we've studied so far, the ancient stuff was thrown out. And Descartes, what we're gonna read today, step-by-step step throws out Aristotle. And um, you're, I can teach that, but I'm gonna, you know, before I do that, I am going to ask you about your, um, stuff. Um, and so then the problem is dualism, the split between the mind and the body and how he detaches it again through math. But this, so it's similar to Augustine in the sense you start with math, but he doesn't necessarily uh, uh, go with Christianity or he thinks about God in a way that isn't particularly Christian. And he doesn't talk about Jesus as the Messiah at all, right? Yeah. And um, Augustine was more into that. Okay, so Warren, I did, I did write down all the things you said last time. So I'm going to respond to the things you said about Martin Luther King because they were really interesting. And then each of you can talk about your reaction to the readings today. And then I'll link those with the whole history of the tradition so that by the end of the class, you're going to be able to look back and see how this tradition has influenced the culture because it influences how you use your brain, right? The culture is telling you which parts of your brain are important and will make you money, will marginalize you or make you, you know, that I look at it from an intellectual point of view because I do think that's the root. Of, of things, even though nobody pays attention to those old philosophers, right? Um, so Warren, you said injustice anywhere is uh, injustice everywhere. And that's really a very well-known slogan. And um, another one is no justice, no peace, you know, right? So, um, and it's all a matter of degree. It's not like utopia, it's just, it's the way a culture works. If you have more injustices, you're gonna go down, you're gonna spiral down this black hole. But if you start improving your situation, you can build networks that where people support each other more. So, um, so you can't ignore what's going on in the rest of the country because it, it's all connected. Um, even now, of course, we have a tremendous white power structure and we still do. Um, I would say most of our politics is driven by <clears throat> either working, working white men versus rich white men or women or minorities that play that game and play that role and don't question this and buy into that. Does that make sense to you, Warren? Okay, but it's not the way the media covers it, right? But underneath it, these are, I think, still the main touch points. Um, okay, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressors, but it has to be demanded by the oppressed. It's just that some of the oppressors have to go over to the other side, right? They have to actually rule for the sake of the ruled and use their power. Otherwise, really, you'll just have a civil war basically. So it is a matter of degree, but there does have to be, remember he said, Socrates creates this discomfort. You definitely have to keep people uncomfortable and keep them aware because people otherwise will find a comfort zone 
It's why a number of my students at Lyon, they said their grandparents still talked about the good old days of Jim Crow, right? Because that's when they got to just be themselves and not be self-critical and no blacks were complaining. But, you know, that's why you have to keep people uncomfortable, right? And keep people aware your comfort zone depends upon the exploitation of nature, the exploitation of people in developing countries, the exploitation of non-white people. I mean, you know, this shouldn't be that comfortable for you, right? Um, you have to put pressure on until you change the system. I mean, it's much better for those with power to, to choose to change. Otherwise, you have to break it. Do you remember when I said Bishop Romero that St. Thomas Aquinas even said at a certain point, if it's un unjust enough, you can commit sedition. You can undermine a regime. Now, Martin Luther King was not, did not go that far. You know, he kept within the system of nonviolent and he did go to jail when he got arrested, um, but he kept trying to change it from within and the resistance so that the real problem were the people who reacted violently, the white violent reaction, because that would undermine social stability because you don't have stability when you have that much injustice. And you really have to keep moving toward justice in order to maintain stability. Um, Okay, in the Bible, oh, you said God helps those who help themselves. Okay, okay, Warren, the normal application of that is people are rich. It's a prosperity gospel. People are rich because God, you know, has blessed them, right? And people are rich because they work hard. And if you aren't rich, you're lazy. So just, just a heads up there. Be careful what you quote. Uh, and then the way people apply these quotes uh, is just, just, I was, <clears throat> so that's just a lesson in general is to, it's hard to anticipate how people can misquote, but we've already done that with the Stoics, right? Stoicism sounded great. And then all of a sudden you got the Reddit or Augustine sounded okay, and then you got that little girl who was crippled psychologically, right? So, yes. yeah, so, so it is a serious endeavor, not just to find a worldview, but also to always think about how you're applying it, right? That's hard. Um, the cup of endurance runs over and um, you're not willing to fall into despair, right? Or, yeah, that's, definitely legit. Um, uh, let's see, oppression does not last. I think that's true. Um, An unjust law is no law at all. So we went over with Augustine. Remember, we have these innate ideas of justice. Whereas with Aquinas, we have these natural ideas like Aristotle. Um, you, you have a responsibility to disobey unjust laws, right? It's not that you can't, and it's not that you, you refuse to, you should. And then just um, keep people, keep things uncomfortable without killing anybody or overreacting. Um, the just laws are the um, just laws follow the moral law and the law of God, right? And um, we studied that with St. Thomas. Um, an unjust law is not rooted in eternal law or natural law. So I thought those were all really good points. And that is the Western intellectual tradition. Um, any other comments by you, Warren? I thought it, you know, it was really good. Um, no, I think I, I got everything across and anything that I have missed or anything else that I might have needed to bring up, I tend to put in the, the assignments that I submit on, on Saturdays, so. Okay, good. Yes. Is that working for you, the post, is that? Is yes. It, 
Okay. It is because what I what I do is say we have class on Monday. I might go through the material on Sunday and Monday morning, and I take the notes. Like I take small notes as I go along, and then after I'm finished reading, I go back and expound on the notes that I, on the points that I've taken first. That's what I do for Monday, and then I do the same thing for Wednesday. Because when I'm doing the post, I put the dates, and I say, okay, this is Monday's date, this is two, um, Wednesday's date, this is Friday. So that's how I do it, and I use the same document. So I yes. open the same doc. I say if I do it for Monday, save it for Monday, and then I open the document back on Wednesday to somewhat refresh my mind. And if there's anything that on Monday that I can connect with Wednesday, that's how I do it as well. And then Friday, it's just the wrap up, huh? Yeah, Friday, what I do for Friday's class is the wrap up. And then after all of that, I would put at the end, like what I personally took away and what I took away from what the cl my classmates said. Very good. Um, Would you so, get your classmates to come? <laughs> what? I said when he can get his classmates to come. I think he was the only one in class for two or three times. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's too bad, but both of you are fine. And I talk a lot too. So I hope you're not too disappointed. I mean, we can have good conversations. Is that okay? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine with the way things are. Okay. The only thing uh, I right. didn't I didn't I didn't dive too deeply in Descartes just just as yet. That's I okay. I but I, I, I realized like from just skimming over the material that he is he's an interesting person, I would say. Um, he keeps saying um, God has given him the idea of himself or things he doesn't choose things, things choose him. So I think, I think he's going to be an interesting person, I think. Good. It, yeah. it just means in general, you, you that part of your brain has been active for a while. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, what about you, Alicia? Well, for Descartes, mostly I, I started out thinking, okay, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to like this guy you know, in those, the first part of the reading assignment, and then I get down to the, uh, the pages like nine through 24, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, he, it's kind of like he went back on what he really believed he was going to be able to do, and he, what, instead of creating a model to demonstrate the realness of God, he created a model where you didn't even have to know God to make sense out of life and I'm not that type of person you know I want to combine my faith with my mind and use both of them I feel like I get a better picture of reality that way and I feel like a more balanced person that way um so really it kind of <laughs> I was a little bit sad because I felt like his own faith was lessened by his trying to, and you know, I wondered if he was playing into the spirit of the times because he was doing some of his work during the time, uh, the time period in psychology where all of this debate about um, sensation and perception was going on and how we can't trust what we actually see and feel. You know, just because we're seeing this or feeling this does not mean that that's accurate. And so I kind of feel, I wonder if he got lost himself a little bit in, in his material. Um, instead of finding a way to justify the material to his worldview. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that was, that was kind of what I took away from it. I, the, the mathematical models, and I've talked to you a little bit about this already, Dr. Beck, they just, I don't, I personally don't have the need to break it apart like that because I have the, I have faith. And so I don't need that. I feel like it's overanalyzing. But I know that people who don't have faith or a strong belief in a higher power, they need to see it like that. They need to find a way through natural reason to discover 
any type of belief in uh, a higher being or force. I don't know. Maybe it just takes, I don't know. I feel like maybe it takes away from it though. So, so that's why Alicia says philosophy helps her listen to other people, right? Yeah. <laughs> because people really do think differently. Oh yeah, they do. Um, um, from what she is saying, I, I would say he's one of those persons, you know, those people who overthink things like they have an idea and they have a solution, but then they start going over and over what they have, they had as the idea. And then he starts questioning himself. Yeah. Then he starts yeah. to contradict himself. Yeah. Like, I think, I think maybe that's, that's the type of person he, he is because at yeah, first. I'm not was, sure that he ever got to the result that he was looking for. Exactly. Yeah. Like he just put his thoughts out there. Okay. So first he started thinking, okay, this way. And then down the line, he starts to think about what he thought he knew. Then he goes down into the material more to the point where he starts to lose him, loses himself. And then he starts contradicting himself. That's why she said, when she said, um, when she started to read first, it's like, okay, I think I'm going to like this guy. But as you go further on, that is why it's important to wait or to go deeper into material to see exactly what is going on here. Because maybe if you read like the first few paragraphs of him and you go out in public and be like, oh, I like this Descartes guy. And he was a person, Dr. Beck knows exactly what he's about. Be like, oh, Descartes, he starts out good, but down in the end, he started to like, go back on his word, you're going to think of this person as like, oh, okay, she is this type of person. So that is why some of the time we have to be careful of like, where we stop analyzing things, I would say. Right, like you like stoicism, and all of a sudden, some guy on Reddit who wants to, you know. Well, I think the you. task he set for himself was really difficult anyway. I've not ever set out to unequivocally show other people why I know that God is real and how they can know that God is real. But, and as much as I would, you know, I could lose myself in trying to do that, but I'm not sure that I would be able to find a way to prove to people why it's reasonable to accept a higher power. Um, I know you don't watch TV, but Warren may have heard of a show called God's Not Dead, where a freshman student started to college and he took a class and Kevin Sorbo was the instructor. And Ooh. he had Kevin Sorbo, a guy who played Hercules in the old- Oh, okay, it's the old, actor, but it's- Yeah. Uh, um, he started his class off by making every student sign a contract saying that God is dead. Isn't and this that freshman, awful? Yeah, this freshman student refused and the teacher said, okay, then the only way you're going to pass my test, my, my class, is if you present for X number of days or whatever, and if you can persuade your class members that God is not dead, you pass. But if at the end you can't persuade them, then you fail. That's awful. You know, and it's I don't know that I would ever have been able to do that. And I don't know, maybe Descartes chewed off more than he could handle, or maybe maybe he really decided that, you know, you don't have to have faith along with your reason. I don't know. I just... Okay, guys, I'm here to inform you. <laughs> he has an agenda. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he has a hidden agenda that actually at the time was not so hidden. Um, okay. Is that okay? Everybody ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, remember <laughs> that synopsis where he's talking to the religious leaders? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He's uh, kissing their derriers, guys, because right. he doesn't want to get killed. All right? Right. right. <laughs> All right. So this is, this is important, okay? Aristotle dominated the worldview for centuries, right? Yeah. Then Newtonian science 
emerged. And it was based on math, right? If mathematics, right? And so Newton was a mathematician. So now uh, the intellectuals want a view of God that's consistent with Newtonian mechanics. And that God doesn't make himself into a person, right? Right. That's why you had Unitarianism. Okay. Who's with the background noise? Oh, hold on. That might be me if I'm unplugged. Hold on. Because I think I think I'll talk for a while. Is that okay? Because I think I can put it in a nutshell for you. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't mean to have my thing unmuted. I didn't realize I did. Hold on. It's, okay, there you go. So I will talk for a while. Maybe this will help Ivy. But really, step by step, you could figure out what he's doing. So he wants a view of God that's consistent with science. So Aristotle's view of God was consistent with his science. And St. Thomas then integrated Christianity. So, you know, this huge issue in our culture, the relation between reason and faith, right? This is, it's still huge in your life. It's just playing out in a different way. But this is, this was huge at the time because the Catholic church was threatened, right? Because the science of mechanic, mechanical science, Newton detached science from final causes. He rejected final causes and formal causes, right? And so he's talking about uh, gravity, for example. Well, gravity is the efficient cause of behavior that we observe, right? So he's talking about physical causes. So those are material causes and efficient causes. So he's, he's chopped off the whole idea of why and the whole idea of each thing reaching its perfect form in relation to every other thing. So we're no more biosphere, okay? Everything is just matter uh, moving, right? everything in motion stays in motion unless there's friction, right? First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. So we have these laws that are imposed on the world through our, we figured these out, right? We figured out the patterns. There's no final causality here. Does everybody understand that? I don't know if any of you took Newtonian physics or physics. I never took physics. I wish I'd taken physics. I was spoiled. I could take whatever I wanted. Um, I took physics and I understood almost none of it. So Okay, but it does have these laws and the laws are the laws of matter, right? Yeah, yeah. So does everybody get that final causes, formal causes are gone? Yeah. Um, so you don't ask yeah. why, and you don't put it into any sort of context of a biosphere or a human sphere of human history where people are seeking to be more and more evolved. Okay, it's all out. So Aristotle's psychology started out, it's very step by step. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question when I finish here. Uh, what is Descartes' psychology? How is he answering Aristotle? Okay, so be prepared. Aristotle's psychology, his goal is a correspondence. A wise person is, has trained his mind to be the microcosm in the macrocosm. And he sees everything in perspective. He sees all the patterns that are out there. That was the reason we could evolve in the first place is because all that stuff was already there and our brains evolved because we were successful when we started to identify those patterns, all right? So you start out with sensation and we have the senses we have 
can we have them the, to the degree we have them? Why, you know, why? Why do we have these senses? We have the sense of vision because the world is visible and that sensation evolved in relationship to the world and the creatures that evolved sight were more fit. They were more successful so that genetic mutation survived. Why do we have hearing? Why do we have smell, taste, touch, right? Because things are that way. Plus, why can't we see better? Because some other animals like the ego can see better. Why can't we hear better? His answer is always, we see things to the degree to which we need to in order to think about them. Because everything we are, the whole way we've evolved has led to, we are the creature that understands the world, okay? So we have sensation, then we have perception, then we have um, motion, um, and it's all on what we observed. Then we have um, the inner sense, a uh, sense of space and time. So all of a sudden our sensations are within the context of space and time. Things occur as substances. Okay, natural sub natural species is the primary reality, and then their relation to each other. Okay, then we have um, memory. Then we have imagination. So our sensations, perception, memory. We get an image in the back of our mind of the world. Imagination, and then we start thinking about that over time, and we develop understanding of the patterns that are out in the world. And then we reflect further. So thinking is just reflecting on these cognitions. So we have all this cognition, we categorize it, then we recognize, we, we reflect on the cognitions, and then we develop wisdom, which is the ability to understand the world we live in. There's a correspondence between what's in here and what's out there, if you're wise. What did Descartes do, you guys? I mean, he says, we go through all this and then the mind knows itself. All of a sudden it occurs to you, my God, I'm the creature that understands patterns in a world where those patterns exist. All right, so Descartes studied with the monks at the Catholic University, which every smart kid went to Catholic University. And he hated it, right? Because he wanted something that fit with the science. He's like, we're past that, we're beyond that. Let's get over it. So he went out and screwed around for a while. He got into a duel over a woman and he survived it, but he became this wild rebellious kid for a while. Uh, but he was a math genius. And then he's describing, okay, I decided to come back, settle down and figure out what I really think about reality because I'm throwing out Aristotle. But he has to apologize to the, to the bishops. I'm not really throwing him out, you know, don't kill me. <laughs> but I think he really is. All right, so um, what does he do? So you tell me, how is it, that right away from the beginning, he's throwing out Aristotle. Okay, okay, uh, Alicia. I don't know. It, I may not be understanding very well, but I think what he did was say, like, these patterns exist because I can see them, as opposed to saying, oh, look at these patterns. What are they? And then I recognize them because they exist. I, it's more like they exist because I can see them. Like if I couldn't see them, if I couldn't understand them, then they wouldn't be part of reality. Does that, I mean, I, I may so. be going at it wrong. I mean, Aristotle, you start with all of this stuff. So your wisdom depends upon seeing, imagining, and constantly reflecting on what's there, what's out in the world. So what does Descartes say? I don't know. I can doubt that, right? Yeah. You see, yeah. he's totally going the other direction. 
Okay. He's, okay. Yeah. He's he's separating his mind from the world. Yeah. There's no more correspondence. Yeah. Right. Warren, do you understand that? Yes. 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 And that was why, of course, the bishops were like, hey, get him on the get him on the heresy list, you know, burn him at the stake. Anyway. And that's why he asked us, oh, no, no, I'm a very pious guy. Okay, so he questions sensation. He questions perception. He questions his memory. He questions his imagination, right? Because they can be doubted, so I'm going to doubt them. So they're not clear and distinct. So his criteria is clear and distinct ideas. Aristotle would, there are no, the world is not that clear and distinct. Right, the world is all inter interconnected. And right, for so Aristotle, you know, observing the world was how we learned about the natural world. It's how we learned about God. Right, and for Descartes, he was like, you know, that may not be true. So I've got to come up with a way to observe and learn without looking at the world, without looking at what's around me only thinking about my mind right, right right this is dualism this is the mind body problem right so all of a sudden all you care about is your abstract your capacity to abstract that's going to be your foundation so first he questions and i'll, I'll go back to the chart because do you both understand it's very systematic he knows exactly what he's doing He's he's completely reversing Aristotle's idea of reality. Instead of constantly building on it to find out about the outside world, it's doubting everything step by step. And then you find out about your own mental state. And that's how you find out about reality. Clear and distinct ideas. There are no clear and distinct ideas out there. They're all in here. Okay, so he questions his sensations, he questions extension, time, place, straight out of Aristotle. It's Aristotle's original foundation for wisdom is Descartes, throw it out, throw it out. Then it's physics, because physics is math applied to what, what's supposed to be out there, right? And astronomy. Those can be doubted because they're still based on the physical world and extension and time and place. And we've already established those can be doubted. Okay, now I have math. Two plus two is four. Okay, that's getting closer, right? Um, because it's all abstracted, but it's clear. The more abstract, the more detached it is from the natural world, the clearer it gets. But there could be this evil genius and I could be totally deceived even about that. So now all of a sudden, okay, all I have is three ideas um, that the evil genius, the idea of God and the idea of myself, right? Okay, so who am I? Like, what the hell am I? Now he, just remember this, he's totally detached. Where for Aristotle, who am I? I'm a thinking being in a world that's thinkable. And Descartes is, my God, who am I? I'm a thinking being, but only in my head, right? No relation to the world. So the notion of rational, and he used the word cognition. So for Aristotle, wisdom is the word noose. And so he's completely changing the model. And now he uses rational cognition. Um, I think, and then he gets to that point where even when I'm doubting, I know that I'm doubting. Even when I'm thinking that there's something out there, there I might be totally deceived about what's out there, but I am still thinking, <laughs> right? I think, I imagine, I sense, and I can doubt everything I've ever thought I was thinking, but I can't doubt that I am thinking. All right, does everybody get that? 
Yes. Okay. Ah, now I forgot to bring my prop. All right. I'll have to use this second best one. Okay. So here is a sticker, right? This is a sticker, a tab that I would put on a piece of paper to label something, right? I can't see it. You may have to stop the screen. Oh, wait, wait. I can see it. Never mind. Okay. You know what those little labels are? Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's a label. And then just like the wax, I'm going to rip it in up into, um, let's say, 50 pieces, right? OK. It doesn't look the same, right? I could even light it on fire, right? It would. Anyway, so here it is. It's in about 20 pieces. All right. Would Descartes say it's the same thing? Do you remember with the wax? He said, it looks different. It used to be solid, now it's liquid. It used, and now it's turned dark. Now it, okay. Did he Descartes would, say it was the same thing? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if he would call it the same thing, but he wouldn't deny that it's still there. He said it's the same thing, right? Okay. Because so he would, he would say that it still, it still is react. It's still real, right? Because it has extension, right? That's what makes it real, is it has extension. Okay, so what would Descartes say about my twenty pieces? It's the same thing, right? Because it's the same matter. It's the same material. Everybody understand that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's still made of the same stuff. It is the same stuff. Would Aristotle say it's the same thing? No, because it can't do what it used to do. Exactly. It, not, it does not perform its function anymore. So it's not the same thing at all. Okay, this is very important. I hope you understand why this is important because now all the world is, is a bunch of mass. And now we can impose our minds upon it, right? Under, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I get that, yeah. Okay. If it doesn't have a purpose, then you can decide what its purpose is. You can decide what it is and what it's gonna be used for and yeah. It's silly putty, right? Yeah. It's just material and you decide whatever you want it to be, right? Do you understand that, Warren? Yes, I, I understand. He's basically saying um, you define what it is you decide. You use your perspective or your free will, I dare say. Or your it science. <laughs> yes. Right? Science yes. now is going to impose stuff onto the material of the world and change it, right? Yes. Science is going to impose meaning onto it meaning and exploit exploit the material for whatever somebody wants to use it for, right? Yes. Very good. Do you understand why that's really important? Because our relation to the natural world completely changed. From, you know, the biosphere, we evolved from it to God wants us to manipulate nature for our well-being. God wants us to treat nature like silly putty and exploit natural resources so that we can uh, thrive because we're special. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, that's where we're going. And we still have, and that Bill Gates is an engineer like that, right? And he's literally trying to re-engineer nature to save life on earth because of what we've been doing. Uh, but it starts out with this, what Descartes did, the way, I mean, Descartes is a genius because he figured out how very simply to say what the new paradigm is that's going to legitimize all sorts of science and technology that is going to evolve 
right? From now on, we're going to evolve our science and technology and we're going to impose it onto the natural world. And so in order to do that, we have to use our brains in a way that treats nature simply like a blank slate with a lot of powers that we can then control ourselves. But, we're, but God wants us to do it, right? It's not just hubris, <laughs> right? It's not pride or overstepping the bounds, which again would be what Aristotle would say. But anyway, so. Dr. Beck, uh, yeah? quick question. Do you know of um, Elon Musk? I know of him, yes. Okay, okay. That's, he's that's like all I that. Have no, no. Yes. He's like that. Jeff Bezos is like that. Bill Gates is like that. Do you understand that? Uh, what? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And also, actually, the Koch brothers, Charles Koch, he is the fossil fuel billionaire that gives a, over a billion dollars to political campaigns to preserve fossil fuel. He had a, he's got a degree in engineering from MIT right? So this capacity for engineering, re-engineering nature is now dominating. Did, did you see um, the news headline with um, Elon Musk and the UN? No. Was it the UN where um, his, his net worth came out the other day and one of the major um, guys who was in power um, released a statement that said, um, I think 2% of Elon Musk's um, net worth could um, end world hunger or something like that. Well, he actually, and then, yeah. And then Elon Musk was like, okay, provide me with a plan that shows that 2% of my net worth can in, um, can in fact end world hunger. And I will, and, and he'll give the money. And until this very day, he has not received the plan from the UN. Okay, I, okay, because I, um, I read that he did decide he was going to give, I think it's certain chunk of stock or something that was worth, you know, tons, but it was a small fraction of what he had. Um, that he he, he did plan on giving that. So, I would I would hope that eventually there'll be a plan for. I don't know, not ending world hunger, but you know, addressing. Um, I think it's more important though that it be addressed toward green products, right? If you don't stop the destruction of the earth, there's going to be more hunger. There's not, you know, the desertification. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand why people don't go focus on the green engineering. That is when he makes electric cars. Yeah, I know, Tesla. I know. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, plus besides that, I mean, lots of other stuff going green. I, I don't understand it. It's just crazy. But anyway, my point as a philosopher, it's so important, right? That you can see in a very simple way, this is going to have a very profound effect in, into the future. And Descartes knew that. That's why he was such a genius. Um, but anyway, so now what we've got Instead of those nice, you know, instead of those nice labels, we have a pile of matter and now we can do with it what we want, okay? Um, but here, what he's saying is, all I know at the moment is my mind, right? Whatever it is, I know that I think. That's all I know, right? Now, in the past, I thought that what I was thinking was about the outside world, that I judged that I am looking at the lamp on my desk, and I thought I was right. Now I know, no, you know, all, all I know is myself, that I'm thinking. Now, there could be this evil genius who is deceiving me, right? So I know that I have this idea of God in my head. And, okay, Warren and Alicia, this again is where he is completely 
deconstructing and reconstructing Aristotle, all right? Now, Aristotle um, uh, actually, Aristotle did not say God was infinite because Aristotle said infinity never exists. It exists potentially, but never actually. So God is the pure actuality, but, but that's all right. That by this time, God being infinite was just standard practice. And so you had to say that. So my idea of God is that God is infinite. My idea is, and my mind is not infinite. I know that my own mind is not infinite because I know that I used to think things that I know now are false. So there's no way I'm not infinite and I'm not all knowing, right? So my ideas about God couldn't come from me. I couldn't have made them up. My ideas about anything extended and physical, I could make up. They might be false because I can make them up, right? I can imagine um, uh, a unicorn, right? I can imagine it. It doesn't exist, but I can imagine it because I haven't, you know, I know what a horse is and I know what horns are and all that stuff. Um, but my idea of God is different. Um, so I cannot be the cause of my idea. So God is the cause. Now, remember the, remember Aristotle's proofs for God. The first one was God is the, is the actuality, the pure actuality. So if you remember Aristotle's um, argument from motion, remember I said, I'm going to move, not, you know, matter doesn't move itself. And I said, I'm going to move. Okay, matter moves itself. And then we said, I, ha I actually have an idea. And then the idea, I have the potential to move. And so motion is this change from potential to actual, but there had to be a prior actuality. So the universe is in motion. It couldn't move itself. At motion is a move from potential to actual. So God has to exist as pure actuality. God has to exist as the unmoved mover. God has to exist as the uncaused cause. God has to exist as the unsustained sustainer. Do you remember that, Warren? Yes, I remember. So Aristotle started with what we know about the universe and drew this conclusion to the existence of an unmoved mover, right? Descartes eliminates all of that and his, his source of his proof for God is just this idea he has in his head, right? That's why a lot of people think he's insincere. I mean, there are plenty of philosophers that say, ah, he's just trying to save his skin. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily true. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make, it doesn't matter if he's sincere or not. It's an argument, right? Is this, is this a good way to think about God? It definitely detaches you from the natural world. This is not God uh, connected to nature at all. Um, okay, so I make mistakes. Okay, number four is about my free will. And he says, my, facult uh, my ability to do stuff is unlimited. I, that's what it means. I am made in the image of God. So he agrees with Christianity that your free will is your most important characteristic, right? Do you remember that with Augustine? With Aristotle, we are primarily the, the creature that seeks wisdom. But with Augustine, we are primarily the creature that has free will and either uses it to be saved or damned after death. Is that, do you remember that, Warren and Alicia? Yeah, I remember that, the whole okay. free will thing. Yeah, I mean, I hope you don't mind if I keep stopping. I, I just, please just interrupt me if, if you get lost, because it all connects. But if you get lost, <laughs> it's good. Well, I, 
I just wanted to clarify real quick before you move on then. Aristotle took what he knew about the universe and incorporated God into that. Or, or you know, that's how he reasoned about God, right? So the Descartes, universe, the universe is not self-moving, <coughs> right? Sustaining. But you have to know every a lot about the universe before you can possibly get to that, right? Whereas right. for Descartes, you doubt everything. You don't have to know nothing about nothing. All you have to do is know your what's in your brain. Right. He took what he knew about himself to say that that's why God is real. It's just a pure idea. Yeah. Okay. And it's an idea of a creature that's infinite, all-knowing, uncaused. And so I could not have invented that idea because there's more reality in that idea than I could possibly make up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there, since there was nothing to feed that into my imagination, I could not have come up with it. Yeah, I, I get that. You're supposed to doubt everything in your imagination. Do you get that, Warren? Yes. Okay. All right, good. Um, but number four is about, I have free will and I really want to save my soul, right? I can tell by, by my idea of free will that it's infinite and that I can make mistakes. I already know I can make mistakes in judgment. Um, so my free will is infinite. My faculty of judgment is limited. Therefore, I have to absolutely say that I will not act unless I can clearly and distinctly understand what I'm doing. I won't act on half truths, on, um, you know, I don't want to make a mistake. All right. Is this about real life, guys? How many people can live in a way that they only act on pure and distinct ideas? Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you never do anything until you think you completely and totally understand, you're not ever going to do anything. Like you're, you're going to be stuck. Well, so, you're, I mean, you're in your study, uh, sitting there smoking your pipe and you're not going to go anywhere soon. What about you, Warren? Not a lot of people. I would say no one, to be very honest, can live without um, making a mistake or doing things of all pure intention. Okay. I, I don't know. Yeah, but here's the other thing about it. Aristotle would say a flourishing life is one where you're participating in all aspects of social and political life, right? Because each, each network is important for the development of our humanity. And if you wanna be fully human, you're fully engaged. But that of course is imprecise. And you're going to even, you know, even if you limited your amount of activities, they're all imprecise. And Aristotle said that human affairs are imprecise and you should not look for more precision than you can have. And that's because you might really have all the data that sugar is addictive and the human body should not eat it because it makes us sick. We have all the data. Does that mean we're never going to choose to eat sugar? <laughs> No. <laughs> does that mean, you know, that does, but also we can eat some, right? It's imprecise. Um, no moderation. That's right. So Aristotle's whole thing is the mean between extremes. You have to make a judgment call. It's, it's imprecise. Life is co complexity and ambiguity, right? Fairness to opposing points of view, considering, think about how different that is that model for practical wisdom, how to live, compared to Descartes. Well, you go back to that whole idea about a mathematical model. If your model has error or if following that model causes you to act in error, then that model can't be correct. So they don't have any 
flexibility. They don't have any room for uncertainty. That's right, definitely. Yeah. Insert uncertainty is irrational. And I, you know, but that kind of certainty is inhumane. It's not human, right? You would never marry, you would never have children. You would never, you know, get involved in a social club or get involved in politics or try to figure out who to vote for, right? It's, it's, in, it's not human, but that's why you do have a lot of mathematically inclined people. They can be anywhere on the political spectrum and they can, um, I mean, they have any number of beliefs about anything because nothing necessarily follows, but also you'll find mathematicians who are absolutists in relationship to human affairs. Certain things are absolutely right or absolutely wrong and you don't account for circumstances. I mean, they wouldn't, you have to, if you're acting totally on reason, they would not take, take into account cultural racism or cultural sexism, any sort of stuff, you know, that's messy and that has a history behind it and that make, makes people's lives difficult. Well, they're not interested in, um, what do they call it, Warren, um, individual differences. They don't wanna make any room for the experience of reality because there's not any ultimate facts that can be had out of somebody's experience because everybody experiences it differently. And, and there's not, it's like a dynamic systems. There's too many factors, so they just don't want to include it. That's why Aristotle's model is you get advisors to come in and have a collective mind to deal with a subject. And then it's imprecise and you have to keep re-examining. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, and this view is the opposite. And um, um, this, I hope you can, it, it's not supposed to be individualistic, right? Everybody should agree on what the absolutely rational thing is to do. But as a matter of fact, it tends to make people so isolated that they're, they're individualistic in the sense that they're isolated from society. They're detached. Uh, does that make sense to, the, to you all? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and Jeff Bezos, I mean, I think that thing about rocket ships, I think they know that life on earth could end, but why on earth do you think you're gonna be able to get on a rocket ship? Where the hell are you gonna go? And how do you think we're going to set up a colony on Mars before we actually destroy life on Earth when they're saying we have 10 years, we have 20 years? You know, they're, they're just not thinking rationally, but they're thinking in this very purified reason, right? It's, it's, it's bizarre. But if you take this model of free and, and you know, of clear and distinct ideas, and you apply it to human beings, it doesn't apply at all. So you get people who try that end up all over the map um, with freaky ideas, ideas that, that aren't common sense because it's not common sense. <laughs> okay, everybody got that? Yes, yeah. I, had a, I had a math teacher once that says, it's called common sense, but common sense is not common. You had a math teacher. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so Warren, I have to tell you about my math teacher, my logic teacher in graduate school. He, um, all he wanted to do was hang out in his office his whole life and do, do logic problems with the smartest kid, right? And he actually divorced his wife and married a former student, started another family. So he's got these three boys who are kind of at loose ends because their dad, you know, is a jerk. But um, I used to see him on the weekend. Um, he had custody of his 16-year-old and all he could do is buy junk food out of the junk food machine. And he was 
clearly bored. He didn't know what to do with this kid. And then he told me, I don't know, a year or two later, that his kid had stolen jewelry from his mother. And he said very proudly, I had him arrested because he has to learn his lesson. What do you think of that, Warren? Um, that's a very touchy, tricky situation. Um, really. Uh, to me, I would think you should think that's a wake up call that you haven't been a very good dad. Exactly. And why would you give your kid a criminal record? He was so invested in logic and matters of logic, that it, but this serious situation, he didn't seem to think about it all. Like he, he wanted to reduce it to a logic problem. Yeah. Yeah, that was not a, a very logical thing to do. Well, it is pure logic. It's not a very humane thing to do. Yes. Ha! <laughs> because that that's... I just call the ancient stuff spiritual humanism, right? It's humanistic. It's about being human. <laughs> but, you know, this stuff is not, and it's deliberately trying to re-engineer our humanity, right? Trying to get us to detach ourselves from our emotions and only act on the basis of pure and distinct, clear and distinct ideas. And I would say that's inhumane. And that's why the whole discipline of psychology emerged because the philosophers were out to lunch, right? Or does that, under, does that make sense to you, Warren? Yes, it does. Right, psychology, Aristotle had a psychology. Okay, and now Descartes has this disembodied idea, psychology. And that just, that, you know, led to the emergence of what the way we understand psychology now. And psychology now is, I think, too far to the other extreme. It just is constantly recording people's emotions and you know what the majority of people do and all that without, wait a sec, <laughs> isn't anybody gonna like learn how to rethink some of their emotions? Like there are mature emotions and impulsive emotions and and so psychology went into, well, we don't make judgments. We just do surveys, you know, and we just number crunch. Um, so then that's anti-rational because reason can control your emotions or get you to re-examine them or, okay, you guys, what do you think? I think that there are parts of psychology that are that are trying to help people reorder their thoughts, you know, retrain themselves about certain ideas they have about, well, about themselves or about how they respond to stimuli, why they may think one thing is stressful when for other people it's not. Um, like behavioral therapies. They, well, they call it cognitive behavioral therapy, where they teach you to rethink and then retrain your behavior. But yeah, I, for the most part, for a very long time, psychology was trying to prove that they are a hard science. When to me, that wasn't what the fight should have been about. You know, fine, if you don't think we're a science, that's fine, you can call us something else. But right. they went away from studying what the mind does and what behaviors occur in order to help people. And they want to use all of this knowledge just to come up with a diagnosis. Is that, you see what I'm saying? Of yeah, course. Okay. It's fine to have the diagnosis. We need them. I'm not saying they're not useful, but the diagnosis itself does not treat a person. It doesn't help a person. And so I think that for a lot of people, maybe, I don't know, I could be generalizing here and I probably am. The aspect of helping people has fallen to the wayside in favor of finding factual information 
about the brain and what the brain does and how it causes people to behave a certain way. Yeah, and so, then you can give them a drug. Yeah, yeah. Right? If certain behaviors lead to certain brain chemistry, then you give a drug that counteracts the chemistry, but you never, actually there's a woman just recently said that she was relating Aristotle psychology to cognitive behavioral psychology. And I just thought, whoever threw it out in the first place, you know? Um, yeah, it became pretty reductionistic, but we'll look at that when we look at utilitarianism. Um, anyway, so my main point here is that with Descartes' dualism, that kind of reflective consciousness, examining yourself, examining other people, that's not in here, right? Because examining yourself is examining your behaviors and examining your relationships, right? This is just pure reason, trying to get your reason as pure, as removed from the world as you can to get your ideas clear and distinct. And you act on that kind of disembodied reasoning. And then you would act on principle or on logic. Um, okay, so Warren, do you, do you want to just comment at all on how this compares to what you've studied in psychology? Um, the psychology, what I, what I think, and I think right along the lines with what Alicia was, um, Alicia thinks as well, because I did a class last semester, I think she was in the class with me as well, it was history and systems. And it was the whole history of psychology and how it developed and what it was and all of that stuff. And part of the thing that came across to us was that how we nowadays see psychology as a science. Back then when it just started out, it was a whole fight to get it recognized as something of science. And I think um, that's where most of the foundation is. That is why it is the way how it is now. It's not mainly focused on helping people and trying to have them see how things are. It's more based on, oh, we want to be recognized amongst the mass. And I think if you don't have the foundation right, the building at the top is not going to be good. And I think in a sense, that's where it is now. It's not, it was not about helping people and having them to see what issues are. They just, basically what they're, what they're doing with psychology is you go, you talk to someone, they do some tests. If there are chemical imbalances in your brain, they just give you some education, some medication. They're not telling you why what's wrong is wrong. To, also help yourself understand what is wrong. Because I'm sure if you go to someone and say, who has seen a psychologist or anyone who's on medication, you can say, oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, I have so-and-so. And if someone says, why is it like that? I'm pretty sure they can't tell them why it is. Yes, remember Aristotle that was answering the question, why? And OK, good. And yeah. Yeah, here's how Aristotle would describe it, right? That right now, in order to have science, you want, a, uh, you want a, to establish cause-effect connections between certain experiences and certain human reactions, behaviors, right? But in order to establish those, you have to assume people don't think. Because as soon as they think, they're gonna screw up your causal connection. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, Jesus could say, if the Pharisees threaten this guy enough, threaten to have him crucified, he's, he's going to shut up, right? <laughs> I'm like, no. Exactly. Okay, so Jesus and Socrates, they are the ones that screw up your data. They're the outliers. And so in liberal arts education, you're supposed to think about those outliers that, you know, didn't act like herd animals. They didn't just poke them here and they react there. But 
if you want good data, you got to treat people like herd animals and you have to even want them to be herd animals. I remember taking some of those surveys and they always start out saying, don't think, just answer the question. And I'm thinking, well, what kind of data? This is all just crap data because human beings think, I'm sorry, they do. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes, it makes sense, it makes sense. Well then, if, if you follow an Aristotelian thing, you say, well, how do you want to live? Right, okay, so you're having this problem. How do you think, how, what do you envision for your life coming out of it? You know, what sort of person do you wanna be? What sort of vision of life? What sort of meaning and purpose? What would you like to do with your life? Because you have to have something you're aiming for some reason to get over your sickness. Um, and that would be different for every person, right? Do you wanna get over it because you wanna be a better mother because you don't, you know, you're depressed and you don't wanna be that kind of a mother. So you want to really be able to be in tune with your kids rather than be self-absorbed in your depression. And so then that's something to work toward, right? So we'll take the medication, but for counseling, we'll just keep asking, did you, do you think you did a good job of asking your kid how school was today and really listening to them and they feel like they're being listened to? Is that, you know, and just slowly that, yeah, that's the kind of mom I want to be. That's the kind of friend I want to be. Does that, do you understand that? You have to have an idea of the good to yes. pull yourself out of it. And also you have to, I mean, the, like if you end up in a, you know, institutionalized or something, when you are let go, you have to be given a house and you have to be put into a social situation where you weren't back in a family that made you depressed in the first place, right? Or you have a family systems counseling where, okay, are you gonna treat this person differently? She wants to be a much more engaged person. She wants to change. But she has to, uh, you know, you have to treat her, encourage her, change this, you know, black sheep model that she's somehow managed to get. Does that, that make sense to you guys? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And again, I'm just totally guessing here. And that's why I really like psychology majors, because I don't want to put words in their mouths. Um, but... I mean, you can't deny that this is what Descartes says. And then you guys can figure out how is it that a psychology like this is going to lead to a reaction? <laughs> and um, so we will see how the empiricists reacted. And then what you did, what you do in psychology is, is a branch of empiricism, but all the pieces will come together eventually. It's just step by step. And then God, God's essence includes perfection, therefore God exists. That's a typical Aristotelian, Thomistic kind of proof. But again, um, he's, that's why he's trying to appear to be like the Catholic priest, but not really be like the Catholic. <laughs> All right, so then when he comes back, and we're just about done here. Okay, so now, um, that evil genius, right? Um, so that God would not allow any evil genius to have the last word, right? Because God is all powerful. So he wipes out the evil genius also. Um, all right, so he says, okay, my idea of God is good and God is infinite, all powerful, blah, blah, blah. So now I, I trust that God won't deceive me and the evil demon doesn't have the power to deceive me. So, but I have to be really careful how I come back into studying the world. So first of all, I have to make sure I don't act on anything with clear and distinct ideas. Next, um, I have to keep in mind my idea of God and my idea of myself is that then I can go back to abstract math. Yeah, I can trust the two and two is four. That's the first one. That's the most, the second most clear and distinct. 
then I can go back to astronomy and physics because the stars do act in a very regular way. So this, the mathematical study of them is probably trustworthy as long as I'm careful. And then physics, then I can go back to medicine, which is even less precise. But if I keep focused on my, and this would be if I keep focused on developing drugs that actually respond to the chemistry, the, the brain chemistry of depression, my drug actually addresses that brain chemistry, right? That's clear and distinct, that's science. But of course you never ask, well, how is it the person got that way, right? Genetics, but also what sort of family system did they grow up in? You know, you never ask that. You just ask if the medication fits chemically with the chemical problem in the brain, right? And then, when I'm making judgments about um, true and false, right? I just have to make sure that I'm as clear and distinct as possible. And then if it's muddy and fuzzy, maybe I shouldn't make any judgment at all, right? Um, and then in my imagination, I have to make sure not to act unless I understand it. And I can bring back extension time and sensations, but I have to be really, really careful. And I'm not gonna start with sensations. I'm gonna focus on how my reason filters sensations. And so that's Newtonian physics. In Newton had a mathematical formula for a body in motion stays in motion till friction, right? Those are just very generic bodies of matter. And so even when you're looking at something and it has color and shape and whatever, you try to look at it through these categories of math. And that's the most precise way to do it. That's also the way to manipulate it. That's the way engineers look at stuff, right? Does that, does that make sense to y'all? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. And so, so, yeah, we have two minutes, but just to give you every time I teach, I go, this is incredible, right? In the sense of it's such a relatively simple archetype. It's something, you know, you don't have to have an IQ of 150 to get it. And yet it has so much impact on the way the culture developed. And it wasn't because most people think that way. It was just because enough really smart people think that way. And then really greedy people can hire those really smart people. <laughs> and okay, and so that's how we end up with Elon Musk, great example, Warren, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, um, you know, all those, those techies. Um, and then Charles uh, Koch also, it's a bunch of engineers that are, engineering our exploitation of fossil fuels and causing carbon to be released and a bunch of engineers that are trying desperately to re-engineer everything and suck that carbon out of the air. So it's a war between a bunch of engineers. And, oh boy, some of them think about God in a way that it's okay and God will, you know, take care of it or not. And some of them think, oh my God, God, I'm gonna roast in hell unless I re-engineer things. And I'd say most of them probably don't give up about any sort of God. <laughs> like, I don't think Elon Musk uh, goes to church on every week, you know, or um, Jeff Bezos, or actually Melinda Gates is Catholic and she's got in trouble with the church about birth control stuff. Um, but anyway, all right, so it does have, it has had a huge impact. And I put a link in the chat about the UN's response to e Elon Musk's asking for a plan. Good. And so it's a CNN, I think, yeah, it was a CNN report that covered the UN's response saying, okay, well, this is our plan. So anyway, it's in the chat box if y'all want to open it. <laughs> don't, don't I mean don't you think it's so great that you can read all this old stuff and you can go oh my god it's relevant 
in a big way today. Is that, I don't know, is that Warren? Am I just a total nerd or is this kind of important? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call you important. a nerd. Yeah, it's, I was about to say, it's important. <laughs> I mean, a nerd can be somebody that just sits there and, and thinks about totally worthless intellectual things. Well, I mean, if you're a nerd, then I am too. So you're not alone. But I, I swear <laughs> to God, I never wanted to think about something unless it was important. And I end up thinking about these awful white male privileged, you know, canon great books. But for better or worse, they're really important. <laughs> Does that make sense, Warren? Yes, because ultimately in the end, everything that they do or whatever whatever anyone does affects us ultimately, one way or another. Because a culture is how people use their brain. And that you have to have a philosophy that tells you how you ought to use your brain. And then whoever is teaching people the top 10, 20% at the universities are teaching all the smartest people how to use their brain that way. Then you create the products, then you develop the economic system, right? So it does matter to the average Joe. It matters a lot, even if they don't know it. And it's not their fault that they don't know it. Uh, it's just the responsibility of smart people to make sure they use their smarts for the well-being of other people because they do have that choice and they can do real harm or real good and right now we're in the middle of that huge struggle um, and it's all disembodied ideas not my problem it's not my fault <laughs>